And welcome to Mixed Media Live. Uh, some last minute uh, putting together the podcast. Uh, it looks like I need to shift Nathan over on the podcast a little bit, but that's okay. Um, it's been a little while since we've all been together. Um, actually, has it been a month since we've been together? Do you guys remember? All three of us has been a while because I wasn't. I missed one, I think. Yeah, I missed one no, relatively recently. We didn't do one last week. Yeah, and then I wasn't there the one between that. Mm. So it's probably been three or four weeks. Yeah, no, it's it's been a little while. And uh, now we have the gang back together. <laughs> it's cool. Um, uh, so uh, while I'm uh, moving Nathan to the correct uh, position on the screen, uh, either of you want to uh, introduce yourselves? I'm a game developer and 3D modeler. I'm Ben Costello. I'm a flutist and a media composer. And I'm Irving. I'm a filmmaker and uh, media entrepreneur. I own a company called Ariella Productions. Uh, do a lot of things in the media and film spaces. Um, yeah, so we're mixed media. So uh, if you're watching live right now, this is a podcast. Uh, but it's a live interactive podcast. That's the cool thing about this is that if you comment and talk to us, we'll respond and you'll be part of the final podcast that gets published on all podcasting platforms, including Spotify. Um, we love to hear audience uh, uh, feedback, audience, what the audience has to say about what we're saying, which is often, you know, uh, our opinions about different things in art. And so that's what we do every week at Friday on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern time is we talk about art in general, whether it's philosophy or just giving our view over something or, you know, as simple as the business, you know, the business behind the different art forms that we are uh, talking about. Um, bi uh, Bi-weekly, is that the right term? Every other week? Maybe. I think that's bi-weekly. Yes. Okay. So uh, confusing English. Bi bi-weekly, we do this segment called uh, Arguing with Reddit. And essentially what that is, is we look for interesting opinions all over the internet, especially Reddit, where uh, you can definitely find some curated interesting opinions on Reddit. Um, and we react to them live here. Um, it's been a fun time doing them. And uh, I think the feedback from at least our numbers shows that uh, you guys like these. So we're going to keep doing them. I guess we'll just jump into it. Oh, my Skype went out. What am I looking at? Are you guys seeing this too? Wow. <laughs> Multiple great starts here. <laughs> Wait, I'm on the screen. I'm on the screen still. I'm on the podcast still. Okay. No one else I, wish, I wish I could show people what I'm seeing right now. Are you guys seeing this too, or is it just me? What? The two Skype logos? Is that what no. It is? I'm seeing like I'll take a screenshot of like Yeah, I can it's like a just like the Skype symbol for me and over me and Irving. Oh, now it's switched to now it's switched to uh, you, Nathan, and me. So that's fun. Uh, For on my side, at least. Hey. Let me send what I uh, have going here. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I've never seen this happen before. <laughs> and now I have Nathan by, by himself. Well, I get to use that banner now. The Oh, no, that's the wrong banner. Hold on. Stream will be starting soon. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, while, while we're trying to figure this out, um, was that if you join our Locals community description, which you now have time to do as I try to debug this live, um, is you can join our Locals community for free. And what I can do is for the first three Locals people that we get, I will give you whiteboard access. <laughs> but you can draw on that thing while we're talking live. Um, just give us a moment as we try to figure this out. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> oh, it looks like it works. Yeah. Wow. That was that was a time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, our Skype just randomly imploded. Um, just random glitching. Uh, I have no explanation for. But uh, I guess we'll just jump right back into it. <laughs> How was your guys' this week? I didn't ask at the beginning of the stream. Uh, it was pretty good for me. I spent some time trying to find every like classic score that I could find on net films, whoever that I could find on Netflix that are, is still on Netflix. 
So mm. Chinatown, like the one Steven Spielberg movie they have, uh, The Terminal and Land Before Time. And yeah, I'm also starting to work on a larger scale personal project. What does that mean? I was thinking about the um, original uh, Thrawn trilogy of books by Timothy Zahn, uh, kind of the original direct sequels in novel form to the original trilogy of Star Wars films, which are really great books. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what Disney should have done for the sequel trilogy, but they didn't. And I was just thinking to myself that it'd be really cool to like just write music for it, imagining it on screen or something. That's that's pretty cool. That's actually <laughs> that sounds like a big project. I imagine if I like ever finish it, it'll take me several years to like actually yeah. do what I want with it. But I don't have any like external pressure to do anything with it, so I can take my time. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess we gotta we gotta wait. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Nathan? At least been pretty okay. Been pretty busy with uh, school and um, internship stuff, whatever, and personal projects. I got a. Uh, I got someone to help me with the level design for my game, so that's nice because I found that like pretty unbearable. So, <laughs> <laughs> are they any good? Yeah, we started it and uh, it's going all right so far. So that's nice. Two years ago, I saw a Reddit post that was like, "What are some settings that are not uh, often shown in video games?" Or I think it was just in media in general. And it was interesting because a few days prior, I decided that the game would have a very unique uh, flavor to it, and that it'd be a sort of noir like inspired game, which I like noir, but. Other than that, I really haven't mm-hmm. heard of anything like that. The time period isn't quite... It's like, because Noir, I believe, is based off of uh, certain literature uh, that came before it. So time periods of the movie movie era, not the uh, book era. And it has uh, some, like, World War Two themes as well, which is going to be an uh, interesting time. Sounds cool. Yeah, it mm-hmm. does sound cool. I'm all set up. Our Skypes are working. We can get started. So uh, who wants to go first? Who wants to be uh, the first topic? <laughs> ben wasn't here last time, so we'll start with Ben this time. Okay. This this one looks fun. Let's let's try this one. Let's see if it'll appear properly. So this one says, "Auto tune has ruined modern music." Very simple, to the point. Uh, from Killing Collapse on Reddit. What do you think, Ben? Has it ruined music? No, I think the music's ruined itself. I mean, <laughs> the auto tune doesn't help. It doesn't help. <laughs> But if the music's already dead, you, you can't really get any deader, you know? <laughs> is there any music with autotune that you appreciate at all, or uh, is it all... Do I don't appreciate that much music that uses that kind of stuff, no. But quote-unquote product autotune, but things that are like do the same thing on a, maybe a more refined level, uh, they, they get used a lot in especially film recording, film score recording, when you're trying to take all the raw recording from the session and then suddenly, like, you got to mix it, put Mm. it all together, uh, get it ready for the dub stage in, like, 48 hours or less. Things do end up getting, you know... So, like, in limited uses like that, yeah, it's fine. Um, Used as something to, like, cover uh, a musician who cannot actually sing well first off those people they already can't sing so the music is probably not good <laughs> anyway and the attitude obviously doesn't help it's not going to fix something that is inherently bad fair enough i have a specific example for you uh, what about uh, the autotune in beauty and the beast i don't know if you've seen the the emma watson version so i haven't seen it but i i hate the music i hate, hate it which is let's back up so like my last segment here you know i'm going on praising um alan menken and beauty and the beast the animated film is a fantastic score again i haven't seen it i don't want to see beauty and the beast nor do i want to see this new series live action series being made about like the prequel to it who cares um but (laughs) well generally these disney movies live action films why would you do it okay and then they, they try and make it like, yeah, this stuff was great in 1991, but let's like th- freshen it up for the kids these days, which means we have to do all sorts of stupid musical things like Aladdin. What does terrible. that mean? You know what? This could be a whole episode. I go on about this, but okay. we'll, we'll give a short version. So Emma Watson can't sing. 
Yes, very, very obvious. Not only can she not sing, but now uh, here I really would like to know what happened uh, with like just the opening song. It might just be called Bell. She's, you know, talking about the towel and whatever. The song itself, if you listen to the original, it's kind of this flowing, like happy, you know, ex- exploration of this poor provincial town, I think is the line. And when she sings it, the rhythm, when she's, okay, so the line is like, there goes the baker with his trailer, like always. When Emma Watson sings it, here's what I want to know whether it's intentional or not. She make, does it instead of just three eighth notes, she has like, a, it's like a dotted eighth rhythm, dotted eighth, sixteenth rhythm. And thereafter, she just kind of goes on in this field because she's established this dotted eighth, sixteenth feel. So it sounds like a march. And the orchestra follows along with that. So it doesn't have the same like rhythmic feel to it. I mean, not, they're not changing the notes. If you wanted that, you wouldn't even write like change how it's written you just change you know the style indication on top of the page Mm. but it's a totally different style and i'd like to know whether that's just because after like 50 takes they finally gave up and said look emma watson cannot sing the right rhythm so we're going to go with what she has and we the orchestra has to follow along with her or whether that was an intentional artistic choice Either way, it's terrible. My suspicion is that there's no way Menken would have like ruined his work that much. But I guess I could be wrong about that. But to me, like I hear that I'm like Emma Watson, and I'm like, can't she not sing the right pitches? She can't sing the right rhythms, and then it just destroys everything. You know, no technology is going to to fix the fact that the orchestra has to follow her. So was the same composer for for the modern one? Yeah, the same composer, Alan Menken. So he did change some stuff, like did he change like a lot of stuff, or was it like the minor, like stuff like that, like? So I think generally that's like the sort of thing that gets changed. Aladdin is even worse. I cannot. I, I'm never gonna watch that film. The music is just it's horrendous. What, Good. what happens to it? Don't support the the craziness. <laughs> we gotta turn like Aladdin and Jasmine to like some kind of rap singing teenage punks and we gotta, like, we gotta that's kill not what i was the, expecting to hear <laughs> you gotta, gotta kill all the magic like it's got so much of this it's not quite mickey mousing but sort of gestures that follow what's happening like uh in a whole new world you know um like soaring tumbling three wheeling three wheeling on a magic carpet ride right we get like the flutes doing this like swirling little like run up and down and is that in the in the new film no because that's too colorful we don't need any woodwinds well okay i feel like that that is an episode of mixed media in of itself <laughs> aren't they so what else do they have in, in the works now i think they have uh a sleeping beauty i i've heard i think i've heard that yeah something like that and I've heard of the prequel thing too, and I was it immediately terrified me. <laughs> the what thing? Uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast. They're making a prequel. It just follows like Gaston, right, and like the other yeah, Gaston, like random Raku, characters. Yeah. Oh right. yeah, yeah. They're asking to be a, a meme on the internet I, again <laughs> with this concept. Like that, that's what these people want to watch. You want to watch like the backstory of the villain. The backstory him. of Gaston, <laughs> not any any villain. I don't I, I don't get it. Like, like who watched it thirty years ago and said, "Wow, I just really want to know like how did Gaston get to be the brute he that he is?" <laughs> <laughs> it's just so absurd. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I, I would never. It's creative, I guess. Maybe desperate is the better word, but. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, oh, we, we've gotten a bit off auto tune, but <laughs> no, it's okay. Oh man, uh, shall we go to the next one? Sure. sure. All right, this one is a gaming one. Again, I picked these completely at random. I have no idea when they were pulled or what. Um, but this one says, "Fortnite ruined modern gaming through the po- popularization of the Battle Pass." Uh, so this one's uh, from me. Well, actually, technically, uh, Steph actually, uh, Steph, my wife, uh, roamed through. Uh, uh, read it and found some of these so uh fortnite ruined modern gaming through the popularization of the battle pass and then this burn person says i think we can all agree that the battle pass is one of the worst things in modern gaming every single game has a battle pass now whether it needs one or not 
and it's about blatant attempts to lock content behind a paywall every two to three months. And then he's saying on top of that, it locks behind extra content and then the DLCs and microtransactions being shoved in your face. Uh, what are your thoughts, Nathan? Uh, I don't play Fortnite, so I don't know what the battle pass is like. I've only played it like three times, like three rounds ever, probably. I do know that when Fortnite uh, was, you know, getting bigger and whatever, the battle pass started to like creep up in various other games. Um that were coming out. So I actually didn't know that uh, they lock content away, like DLC type of stuff. Uh, I thought it was usually just cosmetics because from the games that I play, they have uh, they're not always called battle passes. It's, just, it's uh, like an action game term, like you know, Rocket League is called a rocket pass, I believe. The a pass of some sort. Sometimes it's just cosmetics and stuff like that, and that's that's all the experience I've had. So I would definitely, in that case, would not consider it the worst thing ever. It's just like there are definitely a hundred thousand worst things I could think of <laughs> that go on in games. I don't follow this person's logic because uh, it says right it says it's worse than dlc or microtransaction in my opinion because games put so much effort into locking away content and then shoving the battle pass in your face i don't have a problem with that actually like saying you have to pay for more content if it's like the game is free right like do you expect them to give you everything for free <laughs> like i don't know i don't know you know once again i don't play the game so i don't know the exact details of what's there but uh this would make sense to me as a valid thing to do that's not like scumbag or anything like that what if uh in a hypothetical what if uh the developer never said that they would have a battle pass beforehand or something like that you buy the game i'm not talking about fortnite i'm just giving a generic example you buy the game but you didn't know that there was going to be a battle pass implemented for i don't know new map content every month or something like that and they're going on rotation on like you know uh, official servers and it essentially kicks players out of official servers what would you think about that kind of thing i was okay until you said it said it kicks players out of the official servers is that you said? like let's say half the the official servers become dedicated to battle pass maps or something like that i was about to say so if we we're disregarding that part i would say this is like it just depends on what the developer says right like before releasing the game if the game costs like sixty dollars and they say you get this thing and they give you that and then they add the battle pass, right? That's okay, I think, because you still got the stuff you thought you were gonna get for sixty dollars anyways, you know. The other stuff is just extra. Um they add later. If they said you'll get this and then you didn't get it because in the battle pass plus the sixty dollars, then I think that's a problem. If they didn't say beforehand that there's a battle pass that you'll have to pay for to get that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because having it such that the you know the servers will you might have experienced longer key times because of this. I mean, in a way that it that would be uh, violating the first thing I said, right? Like you wouldn't expect uh, your server times to decrease because you didn't know the battle pass was coming or whatever they call it in whatever fictional game. And I think it depends to what scale, right? Because like uh, multiplayer games uh, that have like paid DLC and stuff like that, they don't tend to have like you know crazy large amount of people playing them in DLC. And especially if you're paying for if you already paid the, for the game initially, it's probably a good amount of content already in the base game. So it's not like something that you would expect to see like half the servers just like get erased from existence from your end. Uh, I think it's probably going to be negligible in the end. It probably would be nice if the company just made more servers to, uh, or not made, you know, like uh, rented out more servers, however they do it in anticipation of the expected sale of the battle pass or whatever. But if it doesn't really affect like the player too much, it's like, oh, my queue time is increased by 10 seconds on average. It's like, eh, whatever. <laughs> I don't think, uh, I don't think it's a big deal. It's like just being considerate of the existing community. Yeah, I, I find that uh, with gaming, developers are very bad at communication and they almost like pander to uh, the mindsets. Like they make excuses for it instead of just saying what the real reason for things is. Like they should just be outright and say, it costs more money to make more maps and we think the game has more longevity in it. So we're just going to make more maps, but you have to pay for it you know, or like make more content that you have to pay for, you know, it costs us money to make it. Well, they'll often like either just ignore the community and not say anything, which I think is a mistake, or they'll say, oh, well, everyone else is doing it. And like, or it's like, just, why don't you just say what it is? It's such an odd thing to me that uh, a lot of developers are just not open with their communities. Let's do one for me. All right. So this one, I don't know who this one's from, uh, probably Nathan, I assume it says, Batman movies are a vehicle for the villain more so than Batman. Hmm. That's an interesting take. Now, uh, when you say Batman movies, you encompass more than just, if you're thinking of the Nolan trilogy, there are more Batman movies than just the Norm Nolan trilogy. 
Um, and I can't speak for uh, the non-Nolan trilogy Batman movies because I haven't seen... Uh, from what I, I'm not a comics person, but from what I know about, from what I understand about DC Comics, is that the villains tend to take a more front seat role in general in the in the DC universe, and when you compare it to let's say Marvel, and so that would make sense to me in terms of Nolan's films. I think it depends on the film because I don't think that Scarecrow in the first film is the forefront of Batman Begins. I think that's a Batman origin story proper. Um, and I think it makes sense for him to do it that way. And when it comes to the second film, Dark Knight, I think that I've watched that movie so many times that I can nitpick like very particular things that I think would have made the movie that much greater than, than what it is already. I think it's an amazing film. Um, and one of my problems with uh, Dark Knight is that Nolan, in the writing at least, um, it puts... Ba- the the whole opposition, the whole point of uh, the Joker's opposition to Batman is that the Joker and him being the, the essentially the greatest arch villain against Batman, right? Is that he is the opposite of what Batman believes in almost every way. Batman believes in order. Joker believes in chaos. Batman believes in anything. Joker believes in nothing, right? He's like the nihilist to the moralist, right? That's the uh, that's the counterpoint that's being set up. It's it's legendary. It's amazing. It's like amazing uh, counterpoint. The problem that I have with it in Nolan's representation is that, and this is again nitpicking. I'm trying to put this in words too. Is that Batman never has to confront the nihilism actually. We are, it's like the audience has to contend with it, but Bat Batman does not. And I think that that growth was needed for the third film to hit better instead of him just being traumatized and bested it would have been better for him to have to actually grapple with not just him physically but his philosophy you know um because joker the point of joker is that he's not physically intimidating it's the opposite of bane let's say right joker is not physically intimidating but he's the personification of uh, essentially chaos whereas bane is like that force of nature you know joker is like is is just entropy right um and decay you know um and i just don't think he deals with it well enough in the movies and i know that heath ledger ended up dying so i don't know what the plans were for the third film and i know joker was supposed to be in the third film uh that would be my only qualm that's a nitpick like i was saying but yeah i'm much more fixated in uh the batman universe by the dichotomy between the villain and the the hero than i am just the hero him or herself, right, in the DC universe. Um, and that also, I've watched uh, playthroughs of some of the Arkham games, and I, I find that that tends to be the case a lot too, is that the vil- it's the thing that makes Batman interesting is not Batman himself, but the villains that he's forced to encounter and how that messes with his internal paradigms, if that makes sense. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you were saying how Batman doesn't face the philosophies of the Joker, right? But... I don't know, because isn't like part of his character that he's like literally incorruptible, pretty much? It depends. I know there are some arcs. It depends where, on the universe. Like the yeah. specific in, in no one's one. Isn't that like the sort of stance he takes, you know? Not quite, because he does make mistakes um, in the film. He does shirk responsibility. That's that's one one point that's made. He goes into hiding and uh, from the first film into the second film. He lets his internal wounds become a barrier to him being who he's meant to be you know this this person that no one else can be which is incorruptible so there's growth in that respect you know and and i don't think he was done yet in the second film like he just came off of the first film where he is sort of reeling from his life decisions and deciding to get back into the arena because this bigger force of nature you know uh appeared uh but he doesn't fully really engage with that philosophy philosophically he just he's able to best him physically when it really counts and that bothers me because i would rather him you know go through the ideation you know because that's not the point of joker it's it's not he's not physically intimidating you know uh he's just unpredictable because he doesn't believe in anything and he says all kinds of things you know he's he has two versions of his backstory in the nolan films for a reason because we don't know his backstory the the new Joker film ends up playing on that, and uh, so ah, uh, I don't know. That that's again a nitpick because I, I actually really love that movie. I give it a four and a half. 
So I really just uh, nitpicking in there. But do you know? Uh, do you have any thoughts on Batman, Ben? Um, I don't. I'm not that familiar with like the whole Batman and the world. But my my impression, at least from what I've been like given from others, and also from like things that I've seen, you know, from the like wider Batman universe growing up. Um, I think the person has a point, I guess, from at least from what I know, that the villains are pretty memorable. People certainly take more interest in like how, you know, how did Joker come to be the way that he is. Joker really reminds me of um, some of the characters in Dostoevsky's novel Demons. Mm. It's a fantastic fantastic novel it's my favorite Dostoevsky novel I'll have to check it out I have some I you know I think Joker is like an archetype you know I think that kind of character appears in some form or another in a lot of places it's it's the nihilist you know it's in yeah. uh, uh Fight Club I won't say much more than that but uh it's in Flight Club it's in some of it's in one of my scripts you know I play on that archetype uh you know intentionally so yeah that's kind of Dostoevsky's like bread and butter too. He's trying to explore like the different variations and permutations of people who I mean, he's dealing with like, you know, like the first generation of nihilists, like people like literally, you know, read Nietzsche and then go off and like make that their lives. Yeah, that's that's kind of Dostoevsky in a nutshell. I love the uh exploration of, of that kind of uh thing. The archetypes. Okay, music. So ah, spicy opinion. So uh this one says John Powell is an overrated composer. So we, we've talked about a lot about John Powell on the on the channel. But it says let, let's let's hear this person out before Ben okay. goes uh, sicko mode. Uh, <laughs> it says while a lot of soundtrack critics praise his scores, especially the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy and the Call of the Wild, I've stumbled upon a certain obscure tra- soundtrack critic by the name of Richard Jack Smith. Hmm. Unlike many other soundtrack critics, he is a lot more critical of John Powell's scores and advocates that composers should strive to do better rather than play things the safe way. Interesting. Then he says, in his opinion, he sees Powell as one of the most overrated composers. He cites generic themes, inappropriate choirs, uh, not being inventive, not trying new ideas, doing nothing more for the listener, and possibly overspotting as the reason why Powell's scores feel inferior. So what makes, uh, and then there's a generic question at the end, which you don't have to answer, but it's, so what makes a composer a film score is great. Okay. We'll start with the last thing here, over spotting. So that's, that's a kind of technical term here. Um, spotting the film is where the composer sits down with the director and whoever else needs to be in the room. So maybe the producer, um, but normally just the composer and the director and they watch the film and if a director says, here to here, I want something vaguely like X. And here to here, I want something Y. So, you know, it's when you make general decisions about what sort of thing goes where happens. Uh, that's a really specific claim. I guess I could, like, dive into one of these films again. And, like, really, you have to, if you want to make that claim, you got to, like, watch a scene really heavily you know not heavily you're gonna watch it really in depth and like that strikes me as like a really odd claim because i can't imagine almost anything significant you can say that about almost any significant piece of film music is this um, person trying to say that there's too much music is that their general point or i think what they're trying to say i my guess is that they're trying to say that it's too too much of Mickey Mousing or following the action. I think that's what they're trying to say. The director says, oh, you know, here you need X and here you need Y and here you need Z and all within the span of 30 seconds. I really have never noticed that about John Powell. Uh, again, it's a really specific claim. Okay, it, is he overrated? Does he do things too conventionally and not push the envelope? I don't know what you're listening to if you think that... He... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, does some of his scores to like sillier films kind of like not do that much yeah like if you watch bolt or happy feet i've never seen rio but i've heard the music to it and there are like three rio movies aren't there the lorax um horden here's a who okay are those great scores uh no no and i know people who are like 
every note that comes from Powell's pen, well, not literally a pen, but you know, is greater than the entire history of Western music put together. Like, and then they, they throw one of these films out. I'm like, uh, no. If you listen to Horton Here's a Who, it's fine. <laughs> it's functional. Like, but it's, it's a bad film, and music really is on the level of the film. Can Powell do really fantastic stuff when he's given the canvas to? Yes. Um, I think other than John Williams, he's kind of, well, I'll keep wanting to say his career is over, but it's not. He's got, you know, the Jurassic Park 5 and whatever the Spielberg autobiographical film is uh, that he's working on and is about to turn 90 now uh, sometime maybe next month, I think. But leaving him out of the question, he's kind of, in my opinion, and I've actually I've actually written this to him and he responded to me when I wrote, said this to him. Oh, um, that's awesome. Yeah, he he's carrying on the legacy of Williams in a really great way, um, but also not leaving behind all the other things that everyone else not named Williams does. Uh, so you kind of he's kind of like the best of, of, of both worlds where. I find James Newton Howard in the scores is more recent scores kind of like the worst of that same trend. Powell's the opposite. He's the best of that trend. Uh, Generic melodies. Nope. Uh, They're all, they're all pretty good. I would say. Uh, And a lot of people are very fanatically devoted to them. Uh, A lot of people are going to disagree with that claim. Does he do things too conventionally? No, I think he's not, maybe not, he's not the most inventive composer. Okay. There are a lot like, goldsmith um or marconi okay they're gonna other composers who come out with like wacky things that are really effective he doesn't generally do things that are like too far out in left field you kind of have an idea kind of have an idea of what you're gonna get when you get a pal film uh like on, on the, like the larger ones like solo or the how to train your dragon films um he does it so well uh, like I said in my last uh, 60 second review for last week's segment, he's not afraid to use all the colors of the full orchestra and use woodwinds, which is just and, and to do it in like a large canvas. You know, you can see someone like um, J- James Newton Howard to some extent, Desplot, they'll do that. They'll have these like woodwinds in smaller, like, you know, a couple woodwinds, like a string quartet and a piano. Um, but he's not afraid to use like all the woodwinds and all of their like colors as part of a full orchestra. It's really fantastic stuff. Cool. Yeah. I actually uh, listened to the solo soundtrack either yesterday or the day before. I have still yet to see the movie. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the soundtrack I absolutely love. Um, and so I'm going to have to get behind Ben here. <laughs> actually, I actually can probably tell you a good, uh, I tested this with Steph. I could tell you a good bit of the story just from the soundtrack. There, there are some things I got specific, like, like, you know, character arcs, you know, roughly correct just from the music and not only roughly correct, but I felt it, which is a oh, pretty yeah. strong thing. You know, solo to, to solo is so when I, I think I made a claim on that last video that it's I uh, how to train your dragon the hidden world the, the third film is either the the best or second best film of the 2010s and the only other film that's you know either first or second is solo I think guys on a roll <laughs> so we all or me and Ben I don't know if well Nathan have you listened to John Powell at all of course I mean I've been forced to pretty much by movies you listen to uh, movies you know I watch or whatever but yeah I still listen to yeah, I listened to the solo soundtrack uh, two weeks ago maybe something like that it's a good soundtrack <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know. We all disagree, in short. Uh, So you should be ashamed of your opinion. No, just kidding. (laughs) What's next? We just did music, so time for gaming. Uh, This one looks like it's from Ben as well. Do you remember if this is, like, from something, Ben, at all? Like, what controversial... What's your controversial, like, opinion about gaming in one sentence, I think? So this person says, uh, games over 10 years old that are not still being updated should be free. That's (laughs) That's <laughs> okay. Pretty straightforward. What are your thoughts, Nathan? Uh, that's like saying like a house that has been renovated in ten years should be free. It's like I don't know that's how that works. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you would think that. Uh, I, I get a certain thing where it's like if a game isn't being sold anymore, like no one's buying it. It's that old. Like it's like you might as well just like make it free, right? Like <laughs> it doesn't hurt. Nothing is lost. Nothing is gained. I guess. But 
Uh, I don't know if that's uh, ten years is a bit short. People still play games like 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 Minecraft is ten years old. So imagine that being free. That, the, the comment right underneath that says like, what does it say? It's okay. You can say Minecraft. Minecraft should not be free. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's still not being updated. Uh, Minecraft does get updates, but uh, still, I still don't think. Uh, also, says Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, like that's like a classic. So, so, or apparently it is. I don't know. I haven't played it, but uh, it's it's definitely a uh, well liked game. And uh, I don't think all the time and effort put into it to make such a liked game should be just discarded because it's ten years old now. Like I don't get what the age has to do with uh, the price of it, but. Yeah, that's my uh, that's my thing. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to that. <laughs> I think it's pretty yeah, straightforward. Yeah, I mean, art art shouldn't generally be free. I mean, I I you know maybe if it's something that's you know in the public domain and like you know hundred years old, but games like they're they're a recent thing. There's something you can still obviously make. Ten years is nothing. Yeah. I, I I don't I don't see I I think all of this stuff I don't know if this is the majority opinion about this kind of stuff but I think this is definitely a part of our current culture around consumption this freemium thing is is like only doable like there's so many companies developers filmmake not filmmakers as much um, really just you know developers of like whether it's software or games or whatever. This freemium model has often failed for a lot of people, more people than you think. Um, it, it really works if you can get a lot of people to play your game. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot of people or like consume your software. If you're not getting a lot of people in your funnel, your freemium model will fail. Um, and because it's because the people who are really have a lot of the freemium stuff are gigantic companies like you know social media is the freemium is a is is a kind of freemium you are the product in, essentially um uh so you know your data gets sold in exchange for using that platform for free you know and it's like okay well that works for a company that is so gigantic that it literally cannot lose you know <laughs> um but does it work for you know Joe Schmo website with Joe Schmo product, you know, that might actually be a good product, but no one wants to pay the actual worth of it. So he tries the freemium model and uh, gets burned because he can't get anyone through the funnel. I think once the era of this, this era of these monopoly goes away, these not monopolies goes, go away, you know, whenever that happens, I think this sort of freemium mentality will also go away. And there's like a general culture shift towards ownership in certain sub segments of society in general. So hopefully that keeps going and we can go get away from this, like, you know, everything must be free, you know, sort of mentality that is pervasive. Yeah. Prices, uh, you should not make your game free as an indie developer, or at least probably shouldn't because, uh, prices aren't as don't matter as much as people think. I think in fact, sometimes it may be working against you because, uh, at a game on steam and you see one's two dollars you're probably gonna think that's garbage and you're just not gonna get it because like why would i you know waste my time on this two dollar game you know when like there are other games to be played someone someone said this i was watching a video someone says like yeah i definitely thought that i just never like really thought about that you know where i like browsing whatever gaming platform i see a game that's like really cheap i'm like it's probably not good <laughs> And then uh, versus something that's like thirty dollars, I'm like, oh, interesting. So, and also there have been some uh, some I guess case studies you can look at of uh, indie games that have gone successful, and you can see what they what happens when they change their price, and it's like the same thing, like nothing actually, like in terms of uh, how many uh, people buy their game, ends up being around the same. Like free games, it just sort of sounds scary. <laughs> Because you know, then you're thinking, okay, but what what what's in the game that I have to buy? Because when you have a free game, you open up a whole like can of worms, right? Like, is this game gonna be pay to win, right? Because like pay to win games tend to be free games, not games that you pay for. Uh, yeah, it's 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 our it's like labeling yourself as free is sketchy in a way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just if you're uh, if you're selling anything out there, just test out the supply demand curve. Essentially, just. Raise your price by a little increment and see what happens. If less people buy, then you know, then you know you've hit some sort of tipping point. You know, if you if you're selling the same, then whatever. I, I feel the same way about bargain uh, bins in 
uh, stores for Blu-rays. It's like this thing is following a material supply and demand curve. It's not following the intrinsic value of the actual thing itself. And then you end up with the situation where you have $5, um, you know, like incredible movies, like for $5. I mean, I, I take advantage of it, but, <laughs> you know, you find incredible movies for $5, like in a bin somewhere. And it's like, this makes you, at you as a studio, this makes you look bad. It makes you look bad, <laughs> you know, uh, because the film is definitely worth more, but you know, just like you were saying, two dollar, you know, game, whatever. It's the same thing. You end up uh, psychologically pricing yourself into a hole. So I don't know, whatever. It's it's kind of strange. So now for me, oh, this one's a spicy one. Oops. So uh, I think Steph found this one for me. <laughs> Race bending in movies and series should not be normalized. This is from R slash Unpopular Opinion. Um, and it says, I find it irritating when characters from books or comics are depicted completely differently by race bending or gender swapping in the name of diversity or representation. It is wrong to change characters that are already made to something else in order to make an audience happy it is disrespectful and should be avoided. I see many people will try to make this context normal, but it should not be. Now, I mean, is this an unpopular opinion? Uh, maybe in its sweeping generalities it is but like if you were to nuance this this sentiment it would probably not in you know literal reality be an unpopular opinion as as is evident by it being you know close to the top on r slash unpopular opinions which is really just a poll for popular opinions that people don't think are popular are are, are uh are popular but are actually popular <laughs> and so yeah i think this is way too generalized i mean you you can pick out like random examples where the gender of a character doesn't matter whatsoever or like or the the race of a character doesn't matter you know for whatever reason it really depends on the context can i think of a good example where it doesn't make sense i mean i think there are many examples also where it doesn't make sense oh let's say taking a character whose nationality does matter to their story white black who cares you know whatever it is so actually here's here's an example this is a this is a spicy take um <laughs> you know james bond might be a good example of this in uh in both in both ways um might be uh, i i haven't thought about it too deeply so don't kill me one in the gender aspect um because james bond being the sort of male spy is like essentially trade trademarked to the james bond that 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 is his his gender is is part of what makes james bond james bond you can disagree with that if you want. I don't think that's an unpopular opinion, actually. I think that is probably a 75, 80% opinion. And in terms of his race, although I don't think that's as integral, he is, you know, British. You know, uh, there are many James Bonds, so it's a little bit more complicated. But, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. What do you guys think about about that? I think I, we talked about this one one fairly recent episode we're talking about mgm being bought by amazon yeah uh, i don't know that race is so important for james bond i think if you make him a woman what's the es essence of james bond the essence is probably that he's like this british suave womanizing spy and he <laughs> drinks you know martinis like i think that's like the essence of the character right i think you could probably make him a different race yeah. As long as it's not too weird for like unbelievable that he's from Britain. Like, you know, if if you if you have him with, like a Russian accent, I mean, he's gonna sound like he's the villain because all the villains are Russian. But um but yeah, you know, if you made him like an African American character played by an African American person, I mean, I don't think that would make a huge difference. I think if you made him a woman or made him like, I don't know, from South Africa, in South African whatever spy department uh i don't think that i think that would change the essence of the character yeah I, I think that makes sense to me too i think the here here's a better way to put it i think the way that i was thinking about it what if james bond was american that'd be weird that just doesn't work with the character i mean the, the actor can literally be american as long as the actor can pull off a british accent unless it's written into the story you know like i don't see how 
that would work. It would just be bizarre. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's what really I mean. I think in general, I think gender is more important than race in almost every story. It, it's like the only stories where, and the thing is like, what is race anyway? That's a whole other discussion. Um, but you know, I think it, I think more important is culture than, than race. If you had like, uh, an Egyptian person, like trying to be the main character in a uh, beast of no nation, right. You know, a movie about central Africa that doesn't work, you know, that like, that doesn't make any sense unless it's written Wait, into the story. What so, about uh, Hamilton? They don't make a lot like the races don't match where, like what they should be based on the, uh, historical figures they represent. But that that's that's different because that's the intended commentary. As if, if if it was just like this is realistic and here are a bunch of you know non-matching people, this uh, supposedly realistic portrayal, I think that's uh, a little weirder. And that's also the original, right? This is talking about like bending, like changing it, you know, to be different. Yeah, I guess it's just it's so situational. It's like this is just too generic, you know. Um, is my general takeaway is it really depends next is a music one here's one so it says it's okay to appreciate the music of infamous militaries ah so this is up oh, ben's alley i think <laughs> um it says i'm of the mind that it's okay to appreciate the marches and music of militaries that are objectively bad two examples come to mind dixie and der koninggratzer marche <laughs> every, every every German is just dying. <laughs> I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> um but it says from a purely musical standpoint, Dixie is a well no- well recognized and well composed folk song with memorize memorable uh rhythms and the use of peasant instruments like fiddles and banjos. Der Koningratzer Marsch is <laughs> is a wonderful example of a military march with multiple tempos and a use of coda as well as shifting major keys. Appreciating a song does not equate to supporting the group it stemmed from. I am heavily against the actions of the Confederate Army, and I'm absolutely against both the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Nazis. However, both groups had good music. So uh, Look, what are I your thoughts, say, Ben? I gotta oh. say real quick, the uh, Soviet National Anthem is pretty good. Can't lie. In a way, in a way. Sometimes I'm like, it's really good, but like, it's kind of weird <laughs> what, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I'm listening to. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't know the what story, about it. It is. The story like, of, of that uh, creation is quite fascinating, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> that's a mixed media episode. That's a, that'd be a cool time. <laughs> story time with Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I might go a little bit beyond just military music. Um, Okay. Is it okay to appreciate music that's, like, directly associated with things that are morally questionable or morally beyond the pale? I mean, obviously, it's kind of a complicated question, and that also gets into, like, issues like we talked about with propaganda and... Yeah. Um, intent to like how it's written, but like on a formal level, yeah, yeah, you can appreciate anything, you know. Do I like on a on a technical level? Do I think Wagner's music is great? Yeah. Would it be awesome if like his opera, The Meister Singer, wasn't sort of about like German nationalism and uh, German unification and uh, sort of taking German culture and imposing it on the world. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice if the, if, the note, if like the words didn't have to do with that um, because it's really great music. You know, I think it's easy to look past on a technical level. You can look past stuff. Can you like something that's tied to something objectively morally wrong? That's a really hard question. Uh, I mean, I ask myself that with all sorts of art of different types. Yep. Um, I suppose... You know, if you recognize what it's connected to and uh, and it's not going to like push you in that direction, then generally probably fine. I mean, I, 
listening to this piece that's you know the composer writes this piece dedicates it to this like woman who he like he runs off from his own family and children live with this other woman and he dedicates it to this other woman and it's about like the beginning of their affair like okay but the music itself is really good is listening to it going to like make me want to do that uh i don't think so so i you know but it, it's it's a hard question to to answer um, I know people have strong feelings. Like if you make this more, more, the more you try and like generalize it, the more people you're going to upset, like, you know, well, can you read Harry Potter? You know, now that we know that JK Rowling is, has X, Y, and Z in her, in her po- personal opinions in politics. Um, Cause it, it's objectively hurtful, you know, to marginalize communities and subjectively uh, anti, trans and it's like objectively pro police like i'm not gonna wait into that argument because i don't care about harry potter other than you know music for the films it's a it's a, it's a delicate question i i've dwelled on dwelled on this question quite a lot you know because it's uh i think it gets to the heart of a lot of issues but um i think there's a point at which at least we've got to recognize that it can get absurd right like none of us is perfect that sounds like, you know, it could be some people would be like, well, you know, that's a dangerous, uh, you know, attitude to have towards things. But I think I think if we all reflect, I think there's a point of absurdity that, you know, that occurs, you know, <laughs> where it's like, well, this person, when they uh, yesterday yelled at their wife, you know, you know, it's not a habitual thing, but had a lapse. It's like, well, that's wrong. But do you just throw everything so then it's like okay well where are the lines and i think that's where it becomes interesting i think it's more interesting too when like you pull out like examples of like well beloved things and the no one knew that the creator of the thing was a very problematic person um and then you point it out to them uh, some people, uh, they don't really say, oh yeah, I'll stop watching this, even though they will say that for something that's more well-known before they watched it. It's because they have an attachment to it. Um, and they, they don't want to do the work of becoming a consistent person, you know, grapple with the, the questions. Um, and so I, I just, I, uh, these questions are so interesting. I wish people thought about them more and were less, you know, just angry bashing keys on the internet and just like you know ignoring the nuance that actually you know needs to happen to have discussions about these things um there are a lot of there are a lot of well one what about any march you know uh for the united states the united states has done horrible things like atrocious you know like so I mean, do we just throw away everything? You know, does it depend on when it was composed or like, you know, like it, it's, it's an right. interesting question. Yeah. Also, most marches are just like fun pieces of music. I, I'm hardly like the most patriotic person out there, uh, but like you can't not love listening to a John Philip Sousa march. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are pretty fun. One more round and then we'll call it a day. Sure. Cool. So uh, this one is for Nathan. It says, uh, the biggest threat to... Oh, it looks like someone asked the question, what's your most controversial video game opinion uh, from a blue check mark? And uh, this person says, the biggest threat to game preservation is game literacy. If you watch a 30-year-old movie, read a 30-year-old book, it's the same media. Booting up the 30-year-old game, oftentimes it's nearly unplayable. The game literacy's progress is so fast, I think is what they meant to say. Even some games from 2007 feel super dated now. That's not what I thought they were going. I didn't, because uh, with the game literacy thing, uh, I actually thought they were going to refer to uh, like uh, our older podcast about uh, um, where I talked about uh, the language of video games or whatever. I don't really get why this is called game literacy. I don't really get what they're getting at exactly. But I do understand the second like section where it's uh, about how and you you can return to a game later and it's like well this is just not very good anymore or whatever it's just I, I think I think the game literacy is just the standards you know the standards have changed for uh, what what's there to expect from a game 
like you know visually and uh, auditorially or whatever yeah it's kind of weird that's a weird thing huh because there are definitely people, definitely people who can you know go back and watch a movie from like you know ages ago like long long like you know black and white film for example right and i'm like oh yeah this is great you know or uh, even silent films but then like a game like like a decade or two ago like two decades old and some people be like this isn't really as good as I remember uh, playing it. Now I'm not old enough to, uh, you know, be able to go back two get two decades and play a game that I recall. So I don't have these kinds of moments, but I definitely, you know, heard other people saying like, it's just not the same anymore. I've had this with, uh, I guess, even more recent games. Where I'm like, this isn't as good as I remember it being. But for that, I don't think it has anything to do with the game genre. I think it has to do with my age and just the fact that I was younger. I didn't quite get, I couldn't quite appreciate good things like that. So I was just like. You know, I, I was like, oh, this is this is the best thing I've ever seen ever, you know, and then eventually as I got older, I understood, you know, these are better than other things and I enjoyed this thing more. And going back to it, it's like, this wasn't actually good. This is never good. I just thought it was, you know. Um, I must, I wonder if this is like the same thing that's going on with everyone. It's not the fact that games are aging. It's that the fact that, you know, people grow up with games and then they just go back to them. And uh, since, since gaming is a relatively new genre, it's not like most people can go back before their lifetime and uh, be like, oh, but those are good, you know? Like, so uh, I wonder if uh, that's what's going on. It's just the fact that in movies, you can go back before you're alive and watch a movie or a song, whatever we're talking about, uh, before you're alive, you can go back and you see, oh, yeah, those are good. But for games, if you go back, like, f- far, you are probably were already alive, you, and you're probably going to go back to the games that you've already played. And upon replaying it, you're just, just going to have some unrealistic expectations expectations for uh, for the game you had. It's probably just like fermenting in your brain the memories, you know, like getting better over time uh, as you as you sort of forget what it was. But uh, and then you go back to it feeling, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. I remember like enjoying this a lot. And you go back and it's like, wow, this is mildly enjoyable. So I'm going to uh, that's, that's my guess. Uh, I don't think it actually has anything to do with the genre. I don't know what about the genre would cause that to happen. Um, there is rapid rapid technological process, te- technological uh, progress that makes things look very different very fast. You know, like uh, you could definitely tell that a game is, is a decade old a lot easier than you can tell a movie is a decade old or a song. You're, like that's that's a lot harder to tell it's a decade old uh, based on like the quality of the sound. Um, we, we would re- reject things like that because they're of low quality because as I said before, you can still enjoy a black and white film and many people do. So, yeah. Do you think though that like, if you, you heard someone talk about like this game that was, was like really, you know, considered one of like the great games of like the, I don't know, 2001 or something like that. And you tried to play it and like, you've never played it before. Would you still be able to appreciate like why people thought it was great at the time? Or like, would you need to have been there at the time? To I think it, uh, I think it depends because some things are liked because they're just they're technological advancements, right? Like, let's say uh, you know, like the first shooters, right? Which were one of the first three D games, right? Now that's kind of insane, you know. <laughs> and I can understand how even if the game isn't like particularly interesting, like mechanics wise or anything like that, it's like a whole fancy new toy, right? That's a uh, pretty like it's like. You know, such a novelty. It's like never done, been done before. It's revolutionary, right? I feel like if I went back and played that, I'd be like, I can get that, but I won't have the same kind of feeling uh, that you had. But if that's not the case, I still probably wouldn't. Yeah, okay. I think I wouldn't, in general, feel the same type of way about any game that's older that someone else played before, because, like, yeah, it's just the fact that the technology is new for some people. And that's going to give them a better impression of the game, whereas the technology is old for me, so. To me, that's not as impre- It's not going to feel as impressive anymore. You know, even if it really is impressive, it's not going to feel that way. So, uh, yeah, just the way I'm sure, like when films were just coming out, people were like, "Whoa, what the heck? That's crazy!" You know, but like, and it could probably could have been a bad film too, and they would be like, "That's great," you know, because <laughs> just like the idea of, of a motion picture is just cool, you know. Uh, whereas today, the, the the technology isn't as like crazy anymore. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um... I think if you go really early into the, it might just be how far along gaming is compared to whatever film and music in general. I mean, music is obviously forever, <laughs> but you know, for uh, cinema, it's actually relatively new in terms of art forms. Like 
I mean, yeah, because the other thing they brought up was a book, which is like a lot older. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Cinema, like if you go back to like the beginning, like the true people think of the beginning, they think of like, you know, some of the early talkies. If you go like even earlier than that, you know, if you go to like moving images of like, or like, uh, is it a Tom Edison one? I don't remember. It's like the horse galloping. I don't know if you guys know that one. one. I'm sure you could have sold that thing as a piece of art and everyone would have been like, oh my goodness. This is amazing. And it is amazing on a technological level, but is it like imparting anything on you like that interesting, you know, especially today, you know, no, it's not. So maybe it's like a gaming is more towards that end of the spectrum of development. I don't know. I'm trying to contrast it like with music and they point out like books. I mean, like music, I mean, obviously I'm never going to get like the experience of like the novelty of a Beethoven symphony, like, you know, wow, you know, I was alive when it came out and that sounded so revolutionary to me and it doesn't sound revolutionary, but I can still, you know, see what makes it so great on a technical and also, and, and on an emotional level, like with novels too, I mean, or any form of writing. Uh, yeah. And obviously like if you want to get over like language and like, slang barriers and stuff like that um weird plot details that don't make 100 percent sense or you know or a little foreign to life in 2021 um i mean yeah generally i feel like again i might not get like the you know shock value like wow i'm reading uh jane austen i don't know why it's the first author but came to my head you know as it's being published uh, but can i like still understand and appreciate the story maybe maybe i think that's probably what the person's point is but it's harder to like maybe you can appreciate on a technical level what was special about the game at the time but like the events are so rapid you might have a difficulty understanding like what's so great about it i was just thinking i think i found like a weird example that doesn't follow this pattern where i don't think many people would say this game is unplayable even though it's old and that'd be pong right like pong is like unironically fun despite being the first game that like people know about right for a video game i mean but it's like actually fun and it's strange you know despite being like the least technologically significant thing in the world like currently at least you know when if i play pong i'm not thinking about like whoa isn't it crazy that they could like move pixels like you know like and and interact i'm just playing pong because i'm like it's actually fun or like snake for example which came later but still is uh very simple and i don't think people would go back and be like this game isn't fun like anymore you know i've never heard someone say about like those kind of games very simple games and mario too mario is a good example right i mean that's a lot further along but yeah i mean tetris, it's pretty right? old yeah. yeah tetris yeah isn't tetris like the most played game ever or something it's the most sold sold game is that, is that the is that what the figure is exactly it's the most something sure. yeah it's an interesting question oh so finally to a chinatown one um but this person says, uh, this is on r slash true film, which I do poke around sometimes on, it says, <clears throat> OK, true film, I feel like a heretic. I watched Chinatown recently for the first time and felt pretty disappointed. Maybe my expectations were too high, given its place in the classic film pantheon, but I felt uh, generally pretty bored and unmoved. I didn't find jack nicholson's character particularly interesting reliable or compelling i thought that generally the film could have gotten away with either of the two intrigue intrigue plots either the waif uh spoiler warning before i get to this segment waterland uh conspiracy or the incest daughter thing but instead we got two plots that are kind of had half baked am i missing something i'm having a strong sense of this being something i'm supposed to like but really don't. Thanks. So I've had this uh, this feeling about uh, some things. Most recently, I've had this feeling about uh, Parasite. Um, I think the first thing to do when you have this feeling about something where it's like everyone else seems to get something, but you don't, is to really just sit there and think about it. You know, uh, it'll be prof- profitable to you as a uh, as a if you're an artist, it'll be helpful. If it, if you're just a consumer of art, it'll help you understand, you know, both your tastes and also just like, you know, atomize, uh, you know, what's the different parts of what you're consuming. In terms of my own opinion with Chinatown, I haven't seen Chinatown in a long while, but I remember liking it. Um, I don't know if I felt, I I just don't remember well enough. I don't know if I felt um, incredibly moved by the story, 
But a few things I'll point out that I think I remember uh, liking. I think I remember loving Jack Nicholson's performance. He's Jack Nicholson, so I guess that kind of goes without saying. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think he did an amazing job in the film. The film is like noir. It feels like what every noir film should feel like, if that makes sense. You know when it came out? Like approximately? Like the decade? 74, I think. Yeah, so it's it's technically like a neo-noir, neo-noir. film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Did my research on noir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's technically a neo-noir film, um, but it's it's definitely in the noir genre. It does a lot of uh, flipping of things on their head, but in a way that doesn't subvert the genre, but really, I think, brings out like the a lot of the stuff that cookie-cutter noir doesn't do right. You know, it's it's not experimenting. It's just uh, playing in the same sandbox, if that makes sense. I'm trying not to speak too specifically. What would I tell this person? I think maybe watch it again. Maybe that, that's all it takes, you know, watch it again. Because I do think it's, I remember reading the screenplay actually more than I do remember the film itself. Because I, I read the screenplay first, then I watched the film. And so I actually knew everything that was going to happen, you know, just from the screenplay. The screenplay is, I, I get why it's taught. Um, it does uh, reveals very well, like uh, revealing, like when you read it, it's more like reading the story as the audience would experience it, which is actually how I write now. Um, which is not really the way I wrote before because I didn't understand that aspect of screenwriting. Um, And so, you know, Chinatown's important in that sense, I think. But from what I remember of the screenplay, I remember there being a lot of just deftly written progression of plot. You know, there's a lot of films where it feels like the progression of the plot is, like, forced... Or we have to get from point A to point B to point C so that we can get to point D, you know? Chinatown does not feel that way whatsoever, um, at least from what I remember. But I think Ben probably remembers the the movie a little bit better. So what are your thoughts, Ben? I mean, I don't know. I think the ending is pretty emotionally affecting in a, in a bleak way. Like, it's not it's not an uplifting, uh, not an uplifting end. I agree that it, it feels really organic, in, in how it how it develops um it seems like it's the antithesis of like the disney plus era that i'm like we're all immersed in you know more you know, obviously marvel uh you know like we know what the character has to do when and they just have to kind of check the boxes on their hero's journey and you know we're gonna, we're gonna force things to kind of happen in a contrived way like, I think it's the antithesis of that. I think it's a great film. Is it like a film that I want to watch a lot? No, it's not one of my favorite films, but like on a, you know, in its composition is fantastic. And the music is awesome too. Uh, that's why I wanted to watch it. That would be my, my overall thought on it. Yeah, I'll say in general, uh, at least for me, as I've progressed along, what's become, I'm a very big visuals guy, Uh, you know, like camera, the camera department, I am unabashedly like, you know, that's my baby, you know, if I'm on set, you know, you know, camera is where I want to spend most of my time with those people. Uh, And I think to tend to think of things very visually. But over time, I've always come back when I uh, when I am analyzing things. It always comes back to the script. It like all almost always comes back to the script. You can have a lot of problems. You can have no visual language. You know, when I say that, I mean like you have no style. None of your shots mean anything. You know, you're just kind of displaying the story. There are a lot of movies like that where the the camera work is just just exposition essentially, ex- expository camera work. You know. And I really, that really grates on me. Um, But you can still get a great film if your script is stellar. You know, it's not going to be the best film. And so, like, I think Chinatown is one of those things where it really displays the importance of writing and knowing what you're doing when you're writing. You know, um, we're like, like in this Disney Plus era, it's just a very formulaic, um, I mean, a lot of blockbuster films for a while now and for decades now have followed the same sort of pattern. But I think Disney's particularly bad at fitting this mold. The three 
act structure, I'm going to do a, a, probably my next mixed media is going to be about three act structure. I think the three act structure when done really poorly is really bad. And it's like, it gets to the point where like, uh, in these modern films, like, uh, three acts, but then this, then they, when you read what these screenplay, these screenwriters uh, talk about when they're uh, talking about the, their Marvel films that they wrote, when you read what they, they sometimes write blog posts about their structure and things like that. You read them, they're like, well, the third act is really two acts with an A part and a B part. And I'm like, do you know what you're doing? Do you have any idea what an act even is? What do you mean A part and B part? What does that even mean? You know, like if you're trying to do a four act structure, then it's four acts, not part A and part B of act two. You know, like that doesn't make any sense. And Chinatown's one of those films where I think it comes off as organic because the writer understands story. Uh, you know, very, you know, whether analytically or just naturally, you know, I don't think you would need to necessarily, um, I think some people are just natural storytellers. In fact, um, talking from a behavioral and psychological perspective too, like a lot of times when you're talking to people, when you're telling a story from your own life, an organic story, you will tell it in, you know, psychologically acts essentially you will create acts as you go along there will be many climaxes as you go along um and i think if you just embrace that natural storytelling instead of getting scared and defaulting to like whatever marvel people say is makes a good story then i think oftentimes you'll get a better result you know so uh yeah that's my little offshoot of that okay last one this person's uh hot take is uh, I think it's supposed to be a logical progression. Every song is good to someone. So that's something I guess a lot of people say. Goes to every song is a good song. And I'm not sure if their commentary is that that is that they're pointing out a logical problem with that or they're saying that is the conclusion that is good or, or whatever. So that, that kind of oh, gets a, uh, at the core of art philosophy. So that's an interesting one. Yeah. The post, I believe, was just like, what's a... What's that unpopular opinion you have about? It might have been like film and music, I think it was. So, yeah, mm. for context. Gotcha. So thoughts on this this uh, syllogism, Ben? If we take that, it's true that every piece of music, I'm just a song, but every piece of music uh, is good to someone. Well, well, let's just assume that's true. Uh, would that make everything good? As much as I, I think all of us like, on this show, you know, make kind of bold and, and categorical claims. Um, I mean, if you like it, that's fantastic. Like, enjoy it. Uh, even if it's not like that, you know, well done artistically, technically. Um, if you like it, great. You know, I, I don't have any, I don't have any problem with that. Um, I may disagree and say that I don't like it, and I may find that they're like structural things that are not great about it i think like generally we're all trying to get at like what what is nearly universally good you know i have my own opinions of like well i think if people thought in a certain way then they would think that these things are good um like we were talking about john powell you know if you don't like john powell that's fine i think for a lot of qualities of music that like i imagine should be like make him more universally liked or like with Beethoven, people are always saying, you know, Beethoven and Mozart are just so like, they speak this universal language. I mean, if they don't to you, then that's totally fine. If they do, well, you're kind of in the majority, we'll say. So maybe it's easier to slap like, okay, Mozart and Beethoven, whatever, Bach, you get a slap with a generally good label. What do you, what do you think though, like when it comes to like, people saying such and such person is underrated and overrated though like do you think those are valid things to say or here i am gonna like tear apart everything we're, we've been doing the, you know this show right now <laughs> um I, so i tend to think that like james newton howard's a bit overrated as a film composer that means like to me i don't think he has like not all his qualities, but looking at it like the way that I, I that seems to me music should be like looked at. Not that I'm trying to prescribe to you, but what I would imagine is like if you're looking at it, what I I feel is like more objectively, you wouldn't like it. Um, and then a lot of people do, so but I'd say that's overrated. 
But if a lot of people really do like him, you know, that's great. Enjoy him. I, and I realize that I'm on, I, it's a controversial opinion, unpopular opinion of mine. Um, maybe I'm just underrating the quality in his music. And you can feel free to tell me like why I, I why you disagree and why I'm missing something. Yeah, I, I might actually disagree with you a bit there. Um, a more recent thing, experience of mine, um, was getting into coffee. So like, you know, getting into the coffee, brewing, whatever world, you know. I think what you said earlier, you know, if they knew something different, then maybe they would appreciate something differently. Or if, And I think that's the, sort of the way that I've sort of shifted about my thinking about things. But, you know, this idea of like palate you know, I, this is not a universal statement, even in my own head. So <laughs> this idea of palate, though, like with coffee, you know, if I look at the way I was consuming coffee before I started getting into brewing coffee, I would think that my parents' coffee that they made at home was fine. And Starbucks coffee was a lot better. Now, when I drink Starbucks coffee, if it's not uh, a, an espresso drink, if, if I'm just going to buy a cup of coffee it tastes like garbage to me, you know? And like the coffee I brew here is like, you know, like not even in the same category and I'm not even good at brewing coffee, you know? And so I think that comes with, you know, a lot of times I'll, it depends too. Like, you know, if you're not going to like coffee, you're just not going to like coffee, you know, that's a different thing. Having your palate refined so that you can taste the difference, you know, like, oh, I see why that's better. And I don't know that that's subjective because it's not like someone had to tell me that, oh, tasting this raisin, raisiny flavored coffee or this, uh, this acidic coffee or this sweet, sweeter coffee. There's much subtler things that I had to train my mind and tongue for and understand why they come about. But I, no one had to tell me that they were better. I just drank it and immediately knew. I don't know if that makes any sense. But, like, I think a lot of times, like, a lot of different art forms are that way, too, in the sense that, like, people consume a lot of garbage, and they don't understand. And when they watch something that's not garbage, they'll not necessarily immediately, you know, say, wow, you know, I've got to stop watching my garbage, right? They might say it's okay, or they might like it, but not see, you know, what the big deal is in terms of the difference. But if you were to say, okay, well, take this art form and spend time with it, try to connect with it on a deeper level and watch so many more great films, you know, oftentimes this person's palette will change. Uh, And it's not like forcibly like you telling them that this is you know, bad or something. I don't know if I'm making any sense at all, but these are just thoughts that have been buzzing through my mind uh, last year or so. Um, I don't know if you have, have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I get what you're, I get what you're saying, Irving. I mean, it is like there is, like, I think, like a line too where you don't want like your unique palette as as it has been developed and as it is kind of conditioned to be developed by nature and nurture. Uh, ought to be somebody else the standard by which somebody else judges things I think on like like a micro level like if I listen to and take like a Beatles album I mean to me you know I don't know Hard Day's Night If I Fell is the highlight of that album like there are other songs of like varying what I find to be varying quality on it uh, I mean I can point to reasons why like I like If I Fell over Hard Day's Night I can maybe say, well, you know, if you thought about it in terms of X, Y, and Z, you might have changed your mind a little bit. But like, is that you? Should you do that necessarily? Should you come up from the same point of view I do? And how much of it is colored by like, well, you know, the lyrics specifically of this song like seem to resonate with me more than like the lyrics of the other song. Um, I mean, I can point to like, I guess again, I can point to like musical decisions in within this song that. I think are, are great. I feel like it's probably got to be some of both. Like, yeah, you want to like develop your palate and then, you know, your tastes are going to change a little bit, but if something really does resonate with you, regardless, I mean, it resonates with you and like 
it's my job to really to really tell you otherwise i don't i don't think so yeah i think i agree with that i think it's like i think it's a mix you know i think of it as a mix it's like there's it's like you're reaching towards something objective but there's subjective necessarily you can't obtain that so there's like a subjective quality to whatever you end up end up producing you know so it's like yeah i mean you know i have preferences in coffees anyway you know but i understand like it's like i i will i will prefer something but it feels more like a preference on depending on that's more personal thing like an individual thing but there's like a there's a component to it that's also like well you know starbucks coffee is just inferior to almost everything else i i drink that feels more objective to me more than saying i like light roast more than i like medium roast coffee or something like that if that makes sense i I don't know Yeah. yeah 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 i don't know it's a, it's an interesting question. This is uh this one sentence I think has uh gotten to the core of uh what we do. <laughs> yeah, I really didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In terms of the syllogism, I mean, logically it doesn't really make sense, but that that's okay. We get the point. <laughs> I think it's just trying to say like something that is good to someone is necessarily good. Yeah. Which is uh, I mean a lot of things are good to people that in i mean if you exit the uh the uh the space of aesthetic i mean this logic would be horrendous and like (laughs) yeah it's like it's just like someone too it's like uh yeah all right interesting it's not even like the problem is like aesthetics is such a weird field i took a, a class in college on aesthetics just mostly focusing on like literary aesthetics but like it you know branched out and like it's it's the one kind of branch of philosophy that it's kind of underdeveloped because it it, it can't really be developed. Like you get like Kant, who's like you know I can like deduce through this logical process. Like there's a way you can kind of find like objective morality, right? Like when he, he turns to aesthetics, and he says, well, in theory there should be an objectively beautiful thing, but I have no idea how you would ever approach figuring out what that is. So I just, well, I'm not even going to try. Like, you got like Mr. Systematic Thinker Kant, who like, yeah, you know, I can't, I can't do it. Like, Kant was wrong about a lot of things, though. He was in. Oh, uh... oh, I'm not saying he's <laughs> right or wrong, but like yeah. for him to just like not even make an attempt, he's like, yeah, you know, in theory, I think it it, it should be that if there's something that's objectively beautiful, but I can't even prove that that's true. Yeah. Much less how we can figure out what is objectively beautiful. Yeah. No, I agree with that. It's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. But I think we're we're done for the day. Yeah, so with that heavy topic, we're uh, done with our Arguing with Reddit segment for today. So I encourage you to, if you like this discussion at all, give us a wave goodbye with a like button. Or if you really didn't like it, the dislike button, if you if you really want to, um we want to know how to get better so if you're going to hit the dislike button one thing you could do for us is to go in the comments and just tell us why you didn't like it and then i will forgive you um and And we just like really really didn't like it just hit it twice and then i'll like really be crazy (laughs) not a scam at all (laughs) um but yeah, so uh, if you want to know when we're going live next or, you know, you want to see our videos as you come out, you can subscribe. You can follow us on Twitch if you want to see it when we go live and all that jazz. Most importantly, though, we want to talk to you more. We want to have more of these kinds of conversations offline and online. So whether we're live or not. So we have a Discord. So in the description is a link to our Discord. If you're on YouTube or if you're listening to this on podcast, hello. We love our podcast people. It's a growing, growing faster than anything else is people listening to us on podcasts and it's awesome seeing people from france russia you know um i mean south africa from literally everywhere you know listening to our stuff is pretty freaking cool so but we don't hear from you guys because it's hard to hear from, from you guys on podcasts so in the podcast description there is a link to our discord and we would love to see you there 
um, grow that community so we can talk about art all the time, not just once a week. Um, we'd love that. So uh, with that said, this video will become live in a few days, like in its post-production and we do editing and stuff like that, like editing out the terrible uh, uh, technical difficulties we had earlier. Um, if you don't see those, you don't know about them and maybe you should be part of our locals community where I put the post the live stream right after where uh, we're done filming. If you just missed us live, uh, you can see us immediately. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that, I guess uh, we'll get going. All right. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. Bye.